Hello, and welcome to our second live broadcast of Who Knew? Today, resident Ann Archer will be interviewing and chatting, chatting with resident Christiane Rimbaud. Chris will tell us of her journey from childhood in Southern France to making Richmond, Virginia her home and becoming the head of the French department in collegiate school. You may have overheard Chris and Anne speaking French to each other from time to time in the promenade, but they promise me this interview will be in English. Just as we did last month, we'll be accepting call-in questions. So if you have a question at any point during the interview, please call extension 6319. Jessica Corbett will take your call and forward your question via text to me, and then we will have it answered at the end of the interview. So without further ado, here's Ann and Chris. Chris, let's start in the beginning. Tell us about where you were born and, and your childhood in southern France. All right, thank you. I was born in the city of Nîmes okay. in the south of France. Nîmes is well known because of its beautiful Roman monuments and it was founded by Caesar Augustus. But it's also very famous because of a special textile which was uh, invented there and that is known around the world and it's denim. Oh, really? Denim meaning de nîme. Oh, I d And it's a special material which then was used uh, in, um, in America uh, for the farmers, workers in the fields, and uh, became very famous, as we know. So the next time I put on one of my many dresses, I can say I'm wearing Denim. Denim, exactly. That's good to know. Yes. But I was born there because um, uh, my family, my parents, and my two brothers lived in the little town of Vergès, which is just a few miles from, from Nîmes, that I'm sure you've never heard of, but you've heard of something that comes from Vergès, and that's Perrier water. Oh. There is a spring, and uh, for many, many years, the spring has been, the water's been bottled in that well-known green bottle that you can buy at, at the supermarket. I have one in my frigo right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's good, I recommend it. <laughs> It was particularly um, liked by the British and by the King of England, who loved to use it as a mixer with the scotch. Ah. That's what I hear. But why was I born there in Nîmes? My father was a minister in the Huguenot Church, the, the French Reformed Church, and his church was in uh, Vergès, and we lived in the manse. Uh, my two brothers and, and myself, and uh, grew up there for a while. However, this was a time when things were happening in Europe uh, pretty dramatically. And in September 1939, after the Germans invaded Poland, the England and France declared war to, to Germany as of uh, the 3rd of September, and immediately, all men were called to the arms. And that included my father, who had gone to the equivalent of the American West Point, had gone to Saint-Cyr uh, to become a reservist uh, officer. And as such, he was drafted to go to, to fight the war. At first, he was sent to near the, the Italian border because Italy had joined the Axis power and to protect the border, but eventually was sent to the north of France where uh, there were threats of uh, the German invasion. So from September 39 until May 40, nothing happened. And then Germany invaded Denmark, Norway, and then the Netherlands, Belgium, okay. and of course they were right there um, in the north of France. And my father was stationed there uh, in what is known now as the Battle of Dunkirk that many people have heard of. The British and the French were fighting together. They were sharing camps and um, uh, munitions, etc. cetera. Uh, and my father was part of that. And of course, you 
you all know that the British were able to, to uh, retreat to Britain. About 400,000 of them did. However, the French did not, and they protected them. And that is not often mentioned uh, when you read or when you see a movie about Dunkirk that about 90,000 uh, French soldiers died there to protect the, the British. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the people who were there uh, were made prisoners. That included my father. Meanwhile, the Battle of France continued and France was defeated uh, in May 1940, in June 1940. There was a, an enormous movement of population, about six million people panicked and, and left to go south. Um, it was kind of um, chaotic. And it was a reflection of the fear that people had because of what they'd heard uh, from First World War mm -hmm. when the Germans were in Belgium. So a total of two million men were made prisoners. Can you imagine? Two million were sent to Germany and were placed into camps. I have at this point to explain very clearly that my father was never in the concentration camp. There is no, no comparison between officers' camps or soldiers' camps and concentration camp, which were death camps. Mm -hmm. Because of the Geneva Convention, uh, the, 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 the prisoners were protected by the Geneva Con Convention and uh, the Germans respected it, and which meant this. The soldiers were put in off flags or they worked in farms or in factories. The officers were not allowed to work and they were placed in special camps. And for my father, that was an off flag between Berlin and Dresden. And there were about 6,000 6, men there living in barracks. Meanwhile, France, which had been defeated, um, lived under a different regime. I need to explain that a little bit. With the defeat of France, the government of France flew to Bordeaux, and eventually another regime came to power. And this was also a revolution in France. The democracy was gone, the constitution was abandoned, and instead there was a new power under the leadership of Marshal Pétain, who had been a great, great soldier during Before. First World War, mm -hmm. and he was revered by the French. Um, this new government, which wanted to institute what they called a revolution nationale, a national revolution. Therefore, they eliminated liberté, égalité, fraternité with work, family, and fatherland. So the republic was gone. Who supported this? Primarily the extreme right, which had been very disillusioned with uh, the government in the 30s. Which was quite liberal at that time, right? It was yes, very progressive. Mm -hmm. And these people were people who were nostalgic of royalty, therefore the aristocracy, people who did not like the French Revolution, the extreme right of the Catholic Church, people who were anti-Semitic, who were against uh, anyone foreign in the country, immigrants, etc., and they accepted this new regime. At first, the French were relieved that war was over, um, and uh, they accepted Pétain, they even cheered him, because he was, uh, they called him the savior, you know, we are, we are gonna be all right under him. That proved to be wrong, however, mm -hmm. And starting in 1940-41, the new anti-Semitic laws were proclaimed, which meant first getting rid of all the foreign Jews in France, and there were lots of them, and uh, eventually the French Jews. Meanwhile, the prisoners settled where they were, 
And for my father, he was a, an officer, but he was a minister. And therefore, he encountered other people from the church, Catholics or Protestants, and uh, he resumed his ministry, but in a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, they organized uh, church services, of course, um, Bible studies, and he undertook a lot of research. Um, they, the, these men who were highly educated need to do something. They were not supposed to work. They would have gone crazy. And they started what was, in essence, a university. And people contributed their talents, their knowledge. And so they organized classes. And shared and with each other. Shared with each other. So there was constantly some going, going on. As, as you talk uh, about the, the French who missed the monarchy and the aristocracy, I think about, it crosses my mind, we here in America think we have such a deep history, but we don't go back the centuries that the French civilization has experienced through, through time. But, but the Constitution of the United States is older. A, li a little bit. Yes. <laughs> it's the oldest, yes. yes. And, you know, I've learned to appreciate what a democracy is and it's something very fragile that needs to be always protected. Who wants democracy, who doesn't? And as a child, of course, I did not understand that. There was no way as a little girl. I knew there was something very unpleasant going on, and uh, I knew that there were people you couldn't trust around you, and of course the Germans were there, they were everywhere, which is totally amazing. What was it like as a little girl to, to live through well, I had a very happy childhood. Um, you know, as long as you are with your mother, you are fine. You feel protected. And mother explained things. And around me, I had, there were friends of the family. I would never know how much she went through during that time, raising three children, young children, and what went through my father's mind as he was separated from them for five years plus. My f I was four months when my father left. I was six when he came back. And that was hard for all families. But this was not an extraordinary family. It was a very ordinary family in extraordinary time. Being in the south of France, there was very little besides vineyards. I mean, it's nice to have vineyards and wine and so forth, but you have to eat something. And uh, so my mother then decided, with my father's uh, recommendation, to go to my grandparents. And my grandparents lived in a lovely a small town, town in the Loire Valley, beautiful Loire, Loire Valley, about 100 miles uh, south of Paris. And that's where we went when the war started. And it was a lovely place. My grandparents were wonderful and I lived there with my brother. I had my older brother, oldest brother, could not stay with us because he had to go to school. He was old enough then to go to a lycée. Uh. And there was no such thing where we were. So that was a big quandary for my parents. What do we do with Jacques, my brother? And- um, This sounds like a modern problem again. Another <laughs> problem. <laughs> and so they knew a place where he could be taken a boarding school in the town of Le, Le Chambon. Now, some people here may know about Le Chambon. It was in the central hills of France. Um, and it was kind of, for Presbyterians will understand, uh, like a Montreat for uh, the French Huguenots. There were lots of camps and there were lots of places where people could spend the summer. But also there was an international school and the whole community was 99% Protestant, mm -hmm. Huguenot. And the, the director of the international school and the minister of that little town worked together and they undertook to hide Jewish children. Ah. And uh, a remarkable thing happened. This community made primarily of farmers 
and the farms were scattered all over the place in the countryside, all accepted to hide kids. And they develop uh, secret messages, you know, communicating with the families. And my brother was in school then, uh, and we often talk about that period, said uh, we were sitting in class and suddenly there would be a kid arriving. We knew that the name was fake. We knew the child was Jewish, but we never said a word and we continued as normal. The town was able to save 8,000 children. Wow. And these children had been separated from their parents, probably were arrested and, and deported uh, at the beginning of the war. So that was an extraordinary moment and time. And um, we were not close to my brother. He was a fair distance and traveling was impossible at the time. The only way you could travel was by train. Mm -hmm. And trains were, uh, I mean, you could barely make it inside. You had to put the luggage through the window and, um, and then sometimes you had to sit with 10 people around you and um, sometimes in the, even in the bathroom, you know. And uh, I remember once sitting, squished between my mother and a German soldier and being a little nervous. And uh, he smiled at me and he showed me a picture of his little girl. And then he offered me a piece of bread with butter on it. Oh. And that was gold. And I remember wondering, do I say yes? Do I say no? Is, is the enemy? I took it. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, as a child, I didn't, it, it didn't matter. Yeah. He was a nice guy. He, and he was nice to a little girl. Yes. And uh, again, I wasn't scared, even though a bomb exploded on the train because there were lots of uh, uh, German soldiers in there. And um, the, the resistance was... Um, very active toward the end of the war. <laughs> now that's the time I remember the most is the, the last year. What which was, was it like? What was it like with the resistance and the bombing starting? Well, we did not know about the underground. It was underground. We knew there was such a thing, but we, it was secret. And as a child, of course, I was not allowed to, to, to hear any of the conversations. The only thing we knew for information was to listen to the BBC from London. And every night there was a signal going boom, 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 which in Morse code means V for victory. Ah. And then also it's the beginning of the fifth the, symphony of, of, of the Beethoven. by Beethoven. And we knew that we were going to hear the real news, not fake news, but real news. And also there were messages given to the underground with sentences we could not understand, but it meant there would be uh, ammunitions, you know, dropped such and such. And of course, when D-Day came, there was the big signal. And um, D-Day, I'll never forget hearing about D-Day because immediately it spread, you know, like powder. and. Um, Les Américains arrivent. The Americans are coming. And that was such an explosion of, of joy and relief. Um, the French at the time were, toward the end, were really suffering um, in many ways um, because of the occupation, but primarily because of the lack of food. Mm. France fed Germany for five years and uh, most of the food was shipped to Germany. So there were restrictions and um, it was okay at the beginning, but it was hard toward the end. Mm -hmm. And the, the Germans fed the prisoners um, once a day. So the families had to supply the rest of the food. So there were packages and packages constantly uh, with food and they need things like books and uh, supplies. And that's where the, the, the International Red Cross did a great deal to, um, to help. So they would have gone crazy otherwise. 
and my father, who was a minister, had asked for a Greek New Testament, and he got one, and he opened it, and inside there was the name of the previous owner, Karl Barth, the great theologian. Oh, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> so he was thrilled, oh. and he continued to do uh, his research, etc. Well, for, for the French, after the first excitement after D-Day, how did things change when the bombing started? That was the worst year. Yeah. There really was, because it was such a dangerous time. From June 6, 1944, until April 45, it was constant warfare. And the liberation was done by the Allies, bombing all the strategic points, which led to enormous casualties among civilians. About 400,000 French people died during the liberation during that year. Mm. And, um, and that's nothing compared to, to other countries. But still. But it's still, it was bad, yeah. And to be bombed by your allies, mm -hmm. basically. It, That's right, yes. That was the cost of freedom. To have Brest and Caen mm -hmm. and so many other places oh, yes. destroyed. The coast, of course, was totally demolished, yeah. So, um, so that was the, the price. And the, the liberation for Europe uh, came after the terrible winter of 44 which was so bitter and it was awful for the American soldiers who were in the Bastogne and the Belge area in northern, northern uh, southern Belgium, and, um, but which led then eventually to, to victory, but it took many cruel months mm -hmm. to get there. My father and uh, his, um, his people in the camp were <coughs> left the camp in February uh, 45, and they were marched. And they, those were called the death marches, when they were marched back and forth between uh, the German line and the Russian coming. And eventually, they were freed by the Russians. Ah. The Cossacks. The Cossacks arrived on their horses. They were fearless fighters. And they freed the French uh, soldiers, and they were British soldiers there too and Polish, and there were lots of American uh, prisoners also in other camps. Um, and then they were walked toward the Americans, but there were negotiations between the Russians and the Americans, and eventually in April 45, then they were in the hands of Americans. And it took from April 45 until June 45 for my father to get home. What was it like when he got home? <laughs> it, I went to the train station, and there were, um, it was a train filled with prisoners. I had never seen my father, but I was the first one to recognize him oh. from the picture I had seen. It was a very special moment. Ooh, I can imagine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's, in a nutshell, what happened to that, my early childhood. The years after the war were very hard. If it hadn't been for the Marshall Plan, I don't know what we would have done, and I will be eternally grateful to George Marshall mm -hmm. uh, for instigating this plan to rebuild Europe. And um, the Marshall Plan meant food supplies to rebuild um, Europe. So it meant um, care packages, sea rations, maybe bicycles, you know, some essential things. For me at school, it meant that every day at 10 o'clock in the morning, we had pea soup. <laughs> and as a child, uh, you know, drinking pea soup in the morning was not exactly exciting, but it was nutritious, yeah. and that's why we had pea soup. <laughs> yeah. and. Um, so I remember that vividly. The, the, every time I taste pea soup, now I think of that. I make a good pea soup. Should I bring you some, or would you rather <laughs> yeah, thank that I didn't? You, thank <laughs> you. But it was hard. And the, I'll tell you something funny about the, the Marshall Plan. The America asked, "What do you need?" And the French, of course, said, "We need flour for bread." And um, they say we need tons of corn flour. 
they are using the British word for wheat. Oh. And uh, generous Americans send tons of corn flour. And suddenly in the bakeries, you could see those yellow baguettes and people wondering, what is this? <laughs> what are we eating now? <laughs> well, they should have been in Virginia. <laughs> but it was, yes, perhaps. <laughs> well, how did you all get from, well, the Loire Valley to Richmond, Virginia? Wow. Well, that came later, of course, much later, uh, after I had gone to the lycée and so forth. It's also because of my father that, um, who had connections here at the seminary in Richmond, Virginia, Union Theological Seminary then, and he was invited to lecture. And um, he met several families on campus, and one of them had a daughter my age, and we start corresponding. And several years later, I receive a scholarship to study with her in college for a year, ah. which was an amazing, amazing opportunity. Where did uh, you Where did you study? Uh, she and I went to Queens College in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was there for a year. I was seventeen, and uh, America then was very, very far from Europe. It was not as it is today. You get there in eight hours and that's it. It took me 10 days on a very old ship, which had been a liberty ship during the war and which had become a student ship after the war. And uh, I was very seasick for, for about 10 days. And then they told us, be sure to get up early tomorrow to see New York. And I remember getting up and finally seeing land, seeing trees, seeing cars, and then the awesome entrance in New York Harbor. That was incredible. So I know what the immigrants felt when they came. However, the first time I stepped on US soil was in Hoboken, New Jersey. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, but I was so, so, so happy. And, I really felt at home immediately in this country. Uh, it was the beginning of a long love affair. Good. And um, I went back to France, got my degrees. I spent a year in Scotland, and um, I received invitation to teach at Mary Baldwin College oh. in Stanton, Virginia. And I stayed there for three years, and then my visa expired. So I had to leave the country in order to reapply for that famous green card. But that's a long story, I don't want to go into that. But eventually I came back to the United States and taught, eventually I taught at uh, collegiate school for 28 years. And there are some of my colleagues who live here and there are many parents mm -hmm. of students who live here also. And also there are people about 20 of them, I think, whom I took to Europe when I uh, organized trips to Europe with my friend and colleague, Helen Tanner. And uh, for 20 glorious years, we, we went to Europe uh, each summer and shared um, the beauty of French villages and uh, other countries. So that was a... So there may be many people watching this program who traveled with you and Helen. Uh, absolutely. And I hope are having happy memories of those, of those oh, we trips. Had, we had a grand time, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, are we getting any questions? Well, we do have a question. Um, so you were talking about the time when your brother was separated from you during the war and he was at school and the children, the Jewish children were being brought in. Um, when y'all were reunited with your brother, did, how long did it take him to tell you all about that or is that something that he kept under wraps for a while? Oh, no, he talked about it right away and we knew um, my mother had been able to go visit him and so I'm sure she told us something, but my brother talked more about it later on, and uh, so we knew what he'd been through living. He lived with a family, I mentioned the minister, 
um, and his wife, and they had eight daughters. The mother was American, so they had sent all the daughters to the United States during the war, and they had taken eight boys to stay with them as boarders. And that's, uh, that's how he spent those years. But I hardly knew him. Like my father, I saw him for the first time at the end of the war. Okay. How much older was he than you? Um, eight years. That's quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I talked to him, I'll talk to him tomorrow, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So after the war, how long was your whole family able to be together before you all kind of started going your separate ways? Okay. The, so my father came back in June 45. Thank goodness he was among the lucky ones. And immediately, I don't know if that means anything to Episcopalians, but for Presbyterians, he was also the moderator of the General Assembly in June 45 in Paris. And uh, very soon after that, we moved to Montpellier, which is a larger city, larger than Nîmes, where there is a big university. And Daddy became a professor at the seminary there and eventually became the dean of the seminary, the head of the seminary. And so I grew up primarily in Montpellier. That's where I went to school, went to the lycée, went to the university, became an English major, et cetera, et cetera. Wonderful. But there's one thing I have not mentioned. Should I go ahead? Yes. I want to share with you, during the difficult weeks that we shared uh, in the spring when we were confined and when we were in solitary confinement, which was very hard, I think, on all of us. You mean here now? Here. Yeah. Here at Westminster Canterbury. My sister and I undertook a project and that was to, to write, to transcribe all the letters written by my father while he was a, a POW. There were three volumes that my sister had put together. She had photocopied the letters, about 800 of them. And they are divided between 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. And um, so I took one year, she took another, etc. But for me, and I had read some of those letters, but not all of them. But each day, I would go with a magnifying glass and I would transcribe those letters because they're written very, very, very small. Oh, wow. If you can see that. The Germans allowed one letter a week and one postcard a week. But I cannot tell you what it meant to me to read these letters from someone who was in, in prison and uh, could not get out, we couldn't get out, and we didn't like that at all. <laughs> and uh, but and it be, wasn't five years for us it either. It was not so five far. years, and I had to remind myself, this is not going to last five years. But I felt that I was truly in communion with him, spiritually and mentally, and it brought me so close to, to him that it was a very, very moving moment. I think. And, uh, but it saved me um, in many ways to help me survive those difficult times. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple more questions coming in. And you may have touched on this already, um, but could you tell us a little bit more about how you ended up coming to the US? I know you, you did your year study here. Um, but how long, once you were here finally, what year was that and um, how long? You, you, you mean when I first came to this country? Yes. What, when I, I had just finished high school, I was 17 and came this invitation, incredible invitation to come to the US and live with this Richmond family at the seminary. They met me at the, at the ship and we spent a glorious week in New York. For, you know, for a French girl my age to be in New York City, it was unbelievable. And, um, and then took the New Jersey Turnpike and whatever, ended up in Richmond. And what year was that? This was um, 
1958. 1958. Yes. Okay. And being greeted by wonderful folks living on campus not far from here and, um, and then going to college. And I discovered American education, college education. And a funny thing is that uh, I lived with a family that they were teetotalers and uh, wow. went to a college, drinking was not allowed, etc. So I wrote my parents, Americans don't drink. <laughs> 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 I went back to France and several years later when I came back to teach at Mary Baldwin, I went to a faculty party where everybody got kind of sloshed. <laughs> and uh, I wrote back and said, Americans drink. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify. <laughs> And what year was it that you came back to teach at Mary Baldwin? 63. And then you've been here since 63? 1963. And then I had to spend uh, three years outside the United States before uh, getting my green card. So I went to Montreal and I worked in Montreal. I worked at McGill University and also at the school board teaching French to high school principals and working in the phonetics research lab at McGill. And finally, I got my green card so I could enter the country. However, that was in September. In September, I don't have a job. So I stayed with a friend and then eventually I found a job in New Hampshire. This was the peak of Vietnam War. Lots of young men discovered a vocation for teaching to avoid the draft, you know, and so finding a teaching job was not easy, but I taught there for three years, and then after that, I came to collegiate. Uh, okay. In 73. Well, that's a, a long journey to get to, yeah. to get to where you stayed for quite a while. <laughs> Wonderful. We have some more questions. All right, so can you identify the Roman church that Thomas Jefferson modeled our capital after? Yeah, La Maison Carré. Okay. It's a temple. Oh, that's, it's the most beautiful uh, temple to Apollo made by the, built by the Romans and it stands in the middle of Nîmes and uh, it's, it's intact, intact. Wow. And uh, there's also the, the arena and there's also the temple to Diane, etc. The Romans love water and there was a, a series of baths where the, the swimming pools, if you like, except didn't swim, but they went into the, the pools. And so Nîmes is a lovely place. But yes, Thomas Jefferson, when he came to the south of France, uh, saw the temple in Nîmes, which is called La Maison Carré, the square house, even though it's not square. And um, he, he was inspired by that for the state capital in Richmond. Wonderful, I never knew. I'm gonna have to dig into that a little further. All right, and one other question. We, we've been asked to ask you if you could read a part um, of your choice of one of your letters from your father. Oh, well, I have to do that at random then. <laughs> well, my I know, father, we're kind of putting you on the spot. <laughs> he was always concerned about the children, you know, what's, what are they doing, and um, knowing what they were like, their personality. Oh, and, um, were growing up and he wasn't there. Yeah. And, um, but also packages, what was the content of the package? Um, and the life there, you know, how they organized themselves in meetings and concerts and plays. Um, and also a great deal of um, discussions between Catholics and Protestants and um, ecumenism and how to be reconciled with one another, how to be reconciled with the Germans also. They were thinking about the future. Wow. Um, um, dear, uh, my darling, I'm happy to be able to write to you. This is totally impromptu, right? A little longer. I haven't heard from you since the 26th of April. May I'm sure it will be soon. There's a lot of animation in the camp. Um, we have made a list of all the veterans and we hope that they will be leaving soon. Chris, uh, there's something I need now, to explain. Now that you've, we've all heard you read that in English, would you read it in French? In French? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, but I need to say something about what he's saying here. The fact that there were two million prisoners in, in Germany, this became a bargaining chip for the Germans and the Vichy government, how to liberate all those prisoners. The first attempt was to liberate uh, fathers of four children. And then it became fathers of three children. And my father had three children. And it's only after both my parents had died that I'd learned that my father could have gone home in 1943, but as he said in the letter, he decided that he had to stay wow. because of his ministry. And it's interesting that my parents never shared that with us. Um, I am certain that it was a very, very hard decision. Do you want me to read it in French? Just a little bit. People would love to hear your okay. French. Uh, dimanche, le 25 mai 1941, ma chérie, heureux de pouvoir t'écrire un peu longuement. Rien de toi depuis ta carte du 26 avril, mais ce sera pour bientôt sans doute. Beaucoup d'animation dans le camp. Depuis les derniers accords, on a dressé la liste de tous les anciens combattants. On espère leur départ très prochain, etc. What is truly tragic about those bargaining times is that it was easy for the Germans to say, okay, we will liberate thousands of prisoners if you arrest those Jews. And um, Vichy arrested the Jews. So for the families in France, you know, it was very important to get those men back to work. There were so many families without uh, head of household, working, bringing salary. So there was a lot of tension uh, between people. Um, there was a lot of black market for food, sometimes betrayals of people. You know, war brings out the best and the worst, and the worst. in people. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And after the war, it was pretty ugly for retaliation. I remember vividly uh, seeing through the window when they were marching, women who had collaborated with Germans, slept with them or whatever, with their heads totally shaved. And I knew some of them, and it's not a pretty sight. And that stayed in my memory. That and there, were, like there was a lot of uh, illegal retaliation of people that accused, of course, of black market or delations or whatever. So that's the ugly side of war, mm -hmm. if there is any pretty side of it. Well, changing the tone just a little bit, um, thinking about France, what is it that you would say that you miss the most about it when you moved to America? Family, 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 and then cheese. And then cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Well, along those same lines, uh, what would you say was your biggest culture shock when you got to America? When I first came to America? Mm -hmm. Oh, there were so many. <laughs> the first one, I think, was on the New Jersey Turnpike when we stopped for a break, and I had my first Coca-Cola. And um, I drank it, and I thought, Ooh, what is this? It tastes like medicine. Well, eventually I became addicted to it. So, but that was my first encounter. I think the most, I'm talking about food here, the most bizarre food for me was when I heard about, um, you're gonna laugh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> I thought that was the weirdest thing. How can they eat that? Did you come to like those as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but that was very foreign. But everything was kind of foreign. Um, the college life was totally different because there is no such thing in France. There is no campus life. Yeah. And um, so many, many things. Dating, like I was, I was asked, would you like a blind date? <laughs> Why do you in want the literal to, sense? to date a blind guy? 
I didn't know about that custom. <laughs> well, it seems like you have adapted beautifully and you've shared so much with us. And I that's know- what, That's what you learn when you travel. And I always encourage my students, travel, spend a year abroad anywhere. You will learn about yourself. And that's what I told parents too. When I t and there was no greater joy for me than to take students to France. Mm -hmm. uh, and I told the family, they will learn to appreciate you all when they travel, and they did. And um, I still communicate with them. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I hope a lot of folks that have been on your trips or been encouraged to travel by you are watching today. And this um, is what we miss right now. Yeah, because you would, you would have been in France this summer if you oh, had been able to go. Yes, 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 yes. One of the things that you and I have discussed in terms of food, since we're talking about food, <laughs> is how much real Southern cooking is like real French country cooking. Oh, yes. Superb. Was, well, Southern cooking is the best American cooking by far. And I truly appreciate the food of Virginia, North Carolina, and, and even further south. And uh, yeah, old traditions, old customs. Mm -hmm. And of course, Thanksgiving coming up, that's a, a feast. It is. <laughs> it's a real feast, yeah. What our book wall called Le Jour de Merci d'Annon. <laughs> yes. It doesn't exist. It's the greatest France. tradition in this country. Love Thanksgiving. It'll be a little different this year. It will be different, but still yeah. very special. So. Well, Chris, thank you so much for this afternoon. We've You're, all learned so much from you. You're more than welcome. So, you know, I love to talk about all that stuff. Uh, we love to hear it. <laughs> Tune in again next month on Wednesday, December 16th at 3 o'clock when Bob Cluel will interview Jack Fraser, if any of you know him, I'm sure you do, about his career as a decorated Army combat helicopter pilot and a special agent with the FBI. Wow. So one of the things we are trying to do with this series of Who Knew is introduce ourselves to the diversity of our residents and the many different experiences we've all had in life. And everybody has a story to tell every person. So you're gonna be busy. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob Cluel as well. Yes. Good. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so thank much. You, and thank you all for watching. We'll look forward to next month. Thank you. Thank you.